Violet Tear Written by Crystal Moonlight Three And read by Gumbasa Part One Bells of Fate The pub was a good place to cool a man's heels and relax. The chatter of people, the warmth of conversation, cheers, laughter, and booming voices. The smell of wine and sharp imported brandy hung thickly in the air. Stiff drinks always helped take the edge off after a tiring day. Well, that was how Cyrus did things, at least. Wooden tables dotted the olden stone room. More a hall when compared to smaller establishments. Like little islands, each of those tables was populated by a colorful bunch of people. In the back corner beside the door, a grizzled sailor necked mugs of ale with his twin daughters. Slouched beside the bar, one of the town's dashing handsome rogues plied his trade of eyeing sweet young lasses from the town square. He wore a deadly smile day in, day out a heartbreaker through and through. And then there was Hallam, sat in his corner, closest to the window beside the fireplace. He was one of the town of Lycia's usual suspects. With every bottle of beer he slammed back, that tab of his grew larger and larger. Everyone had a story, and that was exactly why Cyrus came in here. It was fun watching the world pass by. Even better if he got lost in the crowd, forgot his troubles. Cyrus Lassat, an erudite voice, the sort of a well-spoken gentleman, snapped Cyrus from his musings. He sighed and nudged aside his cup of wine. His peace of mind was hard found and so easily lost. What is it, Brother Barkus? Cyrus sighed at the sight of the unwelcome visitor. A youthful priest, his tall and gangly frame adorned an emerald green robe of fine silk, His bald, domed head bore vertical-lined markings, showing off faith and dedication, ink tattoos of deep dark blue, an insignia for those in full service to this town's goddess, Eloria, Lady of Tears. It is a wonder that Father Adis still tolerates your presence among the faithful, an acolyte of our exalted Lady Eloria, drinking within the walls of this, this, den of iniquity. You are lucky the good father made a promise to your grandfather. If I were in charge of the temple, you would find yourself excommunicated. Cyrus smirked. He folded his arms behind his head and leaned into his chair. But you're not in charge, are you? Besides, I'm not fully sworn. You've no place to tell me how I'll live my life. Barkus pressed his point with narrowed, earthy brown eyes. Fully sworn you aren't but you still hold much favor with our kind and gracious father. I'll have you know that my sentiment toward your discretions is shared by many of the Temple Brothers. A man who drinks and fights is one thing, but one who fornicates outside of blessed marriage has no place within our hallowed halls. More dogmatic ranting? Cyrus rolled his eyes. Who said a man couldn't be faithful and lead a life of his own direction? Please spare me, Barkus. I imagine you've not come here without just cause. Is there something of importance you're looking to share? Yes, there is. Father Adis wishes to see you at the temple tomorrow morning, before you depart for Avalon. Noon is fine, but do not be late. He has taken it upon himself to help a handful of Parsani traders return home for the season of rain. I imagine he would not appreciate any delays. Noted, Cyrus replied. He grabbed for his cup of wine and leveled his strongest frown, too. Now, if you'd be so kind as to leave me in peace, you're spoiling my drink. Barkus groaned. You shall always be an outsider, unionist heathen. Your kind will bring the fall of all we hold dear. The very mention of unionist ties brought a jagged, hurtful twinge. Cyrus honed himself. His hand squeezed into a tightly balled fist. Thankfully, Barkus had already departed by the time Cyrus rose from his chair. For a man who so wore his faith on his sleeve, Barkus knew baseless hate almost too well.
Tonight was the last opportunity Cyrus had to enjoy some peace and quiet before life on the road began anew. A new day brought a new job. Last month, he protected a shipment of wine through the woods leading to Salna. Thankfully, his next task would be far less mundane than the last. He'd be protecting a band of traveling merchants until they reached Ashwood, a town within the forest kingdom of Avalon. Every mission came with its perks, too. A handful of small mercies attached to the job, outside of the usual coin and booze. A chance to visit Ashwood again brought with it a deal sweetener if Cyrus so wished it. Maybe I'll drop by the old mare and see if Amico's still there. It was strange how one night can leave you thinking about Alas for years. Or maybe it's just Amico. There's only one other girl that pulls on my heart like her. Cyrus hopped up from his bed. He sighed, finding his way over to the wide open window. Through the wooden shutters. Through the wooden shutters, the town of Lycia stared him back with quiet fondness. This town was a place he held strange feelings toward. No, he didn't hate this fair sized port with its fresh coastal waters and surprising amount of hustle and bustle. He'd so often woken in the early hours to the chime of bells from the fishermen's boats, or caught the sight of a young damsel wandering from the fruit market and sometimes he watched the monks of Eloria's temple train in the town square. Since the years of his childhood, so much had changed. Not only here, but around the world he'd traveled. Maybe it was his outlook? Whichever way he looked at it, bittersweet felt like an apt word to use. Lycia, especially, was the same, and yet so different. Oftentimes, the old ladies in their patchwork dresses waited by the port at this hour. Cyrus heard them chattering away. Their routine seldom changed. They usually watched the steamboats go out to sea. Then they'd sit in their circles and complain about industrialization starting to take hold. Cyrus had heard them many times over. Their complaints focused around the lifelong enemies of magic, the Union, slowly creeping closer and closer. Their small country, the coastal pact of Nerona, was one of the first nations of magic to consider such ideas and Lycia had opened its arms, in some ways, to modernization. Steam power, rifles, imported medicines. Not that Cyrus objected entirely. Technology wasn't all bad. Moderation was key. A few steam-powered trade ships wouldn't bring about the end of the coastal pact. Same for a few imported rifles from Kai. Strange. I don't often miss this place when I go, but it's a home I can always come back to. Trade with the temple and the flow of mercenaries makes it interesting, though. There are plenty of new faces passing through. Cyrus breathed a sleepy sigh. A long road awaited tomorrow, a road frequently traveled, true, but a road nonetheless. A few hours of well-earned rest would doubtless do him a world of good. He left the moon-bathed town to its business. The mirror beside his oaken, varnished cupboard brought him pause. I miss those days when I slept well, when you were here with me. The bags beneath his eyes of sapphire blue were all too deep, his rugged features creased, and his scruffy black hair more askew than usual. Sighing again, this time with frustration, he reached for his trusty coat, the hood lined with fur and the patchwork finished in icy blue white, the Skyrider coat, a gift from his grandfather Ernest. Deep, empowered bells rang out across the town in a powerful chorus. Lycia's droopy-eyed quiet, fragile as glass, shattered. Cyrus stared out from his wide window. Lights flickered to life like fireflies. High and low, people stirred. Confusion washed over Cyrus's thoughts. The temple? Why would somebody attack the temple, and so late at night? Members of Crimson? No, it can't be. Elder Lorson would have stepped up the militia patrols. Besides, if the Order of Crimson were here, we'd be flooded with Avalonian knights by now. Then who could it be? Duty called. Whatever the case, the longer he stood there, the more innocent people Cyrus risked putting in danger. Whoever decided now was a good time to attack us is going to get my boot lodged firmly up their arse. Cyrus threw on the Sky Rider over his creased black vest. Sidestepping the frame of his bed, he took extra care not to trip over the Avalonian Furbanks rug, the damnable thing it was sometimes. Prepared, the acolyte yanked open the bedroom door and stepped into the hallway. 
cool evening air hit him in the face, preparing him for the night ahead. The path up the side streets was chaos. Droves upon droves filled the cobbled pathways and otherwise blocked up the town's less than ample road system. It was hard to get anywhere. The quickest way to the temple was beyond the water fountain at the farthest edge of town, past the tavern and up the forested road. The tall and burly pushed and shoved to reach Lysias Square, while the less fortunate remained stuck at the back of the pileup. It would take twice as long to get up the hill unless Cyrus shoved through. Move out of the way, people! Cyrus did his best to duck and weave through gaps where he could. Politely nudged those in his way aside, too. Acolyte of Aloria coming through. Please, I need to pass. The temple needs me. An opening amidst the flurry. Finally. Cyrus pushed past the never-ending slew of townsfolk. He stopped at the end of the street and caught his breath, if only for a second. A large, two-floored building of olden construction caught his sight in passing. A light with hanging torches, small wooden benches lined the dirt courtyard. A great many people huddled together in the doorway, packed tight like sardines. The tavern. Halfway there. Time to pick up the pace. Young mothers held their little ones close while the town guard began mustering. No sense in waiting for any of them to catch up. They were readying far too slow to be of any help. Cyrus took off on a run, sidestepping any and all who got in his way. He'd apologize to those he'd knocked aside later. Beyond old Doran's farm, he went next. The sound of panic faded the higher he climbed. Strands of light pierced his vision beyond the thick tree line, in sharp contrast to the evening darkness. Almost there. Hold on as well as you can, Father Adis. Skidding to a stop at the top of the incline, Cyrus shook his senses clear and punched his fists together. He marveled quietly at the sight before his eyes, if only for a second a building of far sturdier construction than the simple brick homes and fishing shacks of Lysia Square, built several stories high of cream-colored Senkan stone. An array of fountains, in the shape of elegant lady priests, neatly lined the courtyard. Water streamed from their palms, while their eyes were closed in tearful worship. Temple of Eloria, Cyrus spoke softly. He brought his hands together in a moment of quiet prayer. Whatever or whoever was waiting inside had already earned his ire for attacking one of the places in Lycia that claimed his wayward sentiments. Goddess Eloria, protector of the divine waters and watcher over us all, I ask thee for humble forgiveness on account of my transgressions. Please watch over me as I stand to protect these hallowed halls. May we all find peace beyond this life within your loving embrace, always. Ferris Ashi. Cyrus stopped before the temple's weighty wooden doors. He summoned everything he had, every ounce of strength. D damn Slowly, inch by inch, he made his way inside. Try as he might, there was no ignoring the nervous twinge within his stomach. Uneasy thoughts darkened his mental sea, thoughts that weren't entirely unfounded. The sight of the main hallway brought a sense of dread. The front desk, where the younger monks often greeted visitors and important guests, lay collapsed and broken, smashed in two. Scrolls and parchment paper littered the ground. Slumped in a chair against the staircase leading toward the library was a monk, one Cyrus knew well. A younger gentleman from his appearance, the vertical line of a water crest crossed his forehead. Goddess, help us. Brother Barkus! Cyrus hurried over and checked for a pulse, he sighed with relief upon finding one. What happened here? Cyrus Lissat. Brother Barkus stirred, his face awash with pain. He held his stomach and shivered. It all ha happened so quickly. Smoke filled the halls, thicker and blacker than the darkest night. B before I knew it, I was down on the ground. Barkus doubled over. He crossed an arm around his ribs. His breaths were sluggish, ragged, and beyond unhealthy. He needed medical attention as soon as possible. An assailant, he continued. A woman. You must go ahead. There's no time. She's already beyond the library within the chamber of contemplation. Father Adis left to get help. We think she's after the violet tear. 
Cyrus's eyes widened. He gripped the monk's shoulders in concern. The Violet Tear? So the rumors are true. I'd often believed we kept one of the five hidden here. Damn, what was Father Adis thinking? Storing something so powerful in a place like this? You mustn't let her take it. Barkus slouched in his chair. A shiver racked his body. Go forth before it's too late. Cyrus got up, his thoughts racing tenfold. He wasn't too far from the Chamber of Contemplation, a place usually forbidden to all but Father Adis. But at times like this, the usual rules didn't apply. Being an acolyte of this temple brought its advantages. The route he could take was more direct. Instead of going around the outer balcony, Cyrus could cut straight through the library. I'm going. Rest now, Barkus. The same library was in disarray. Tomes of knowledge lay strewn and scattered about. Pages were torn from books, and important scriptures lay ripped and tattered. It was downright upsetting. This was a place of learning, not a place of violence. Can't think about that now, Cyrus told himself. He kept his eyes ahead. His shoes echoed in their every step. Further he went, into the unknown. The deeper into the temple Cyrus traversed, the more monks that caught his attention. Some brandished the crest of the warrior sect, their staves broken and their breathing faint, while others held the distinct triangular crest of knowledge upon their foreheads. Some nursed broken arms, while others were beaten and bruised. Made it. Cyrus came to a stop at the sight of a large tunnel-like archway, his progression within barred by the opaque, watery glow of magic. It flowed and swirled in solid form, impassable, at least for now. Now to get this thing open. I never thought my status as an acolyte would serve me in a situation like this. Cyrus took off his coat and tossed it against the stone floor. He flexed his arm and brought it into focus. Soft heat tinged beneath the skin of his bicep. The insignia engraved upon his flesh, an artistic marking in the shape of a large crystalline teardrop, shone like a beacon, filling the expanse of the library with cool oceanic light. The melody of an angelic chorus echoed through the expanse of Cyrus's senses, and closing his eyes, he prepared himself. Goddess Eloria, grant your blessing to approach. I, Cyrus Lassat, protector of innocent hearts in your exalted name, seek passage in this sacred place. With permission, I humbly ask you open the way. Water pulsed forth from Cyrus's hand, forming into a fluid orb of energy. Slowly, in yet another chorus of song and voice, the protective wall dissipated as though a mere illusion. The large entryway to the Chamber of Contemplation lay wide open, lit by a lone, hanging torch. Thank you, my lady. Cyrus grabbed for his coat and tossed it over his shoulder. His fingers tingled from the use of magical essence. After what seemed like an eternity, the long, dim corridor widened outward into a circular hall, etched with a fine tapestry and symbols depicting olden tomes, storybooks even. And yet, regardless of the flush decor, it was the dark, purple glow at the room's center that caught Cyrus's attention. A pedestal stood with grandeur at the heart of everything. A small crystal sphere floated in midair. Cyrus took a step back. His head spun by merely looking at it. His head spun by merely looking at it. This was a violet tear, one of five artifacts hidden across the corners of the magical world. Legends describe them as the embodiment of love, the symbolization of compassion, pillars of betrayal and sacrifice combined. Its aura was overwhelming. Cyrus, as though compelled by a voice from within, reached out to touch the tear. Not so fast! Though his hand was quickly slapped away, an exotic, feminine voice grabbed his attention. Reflex took hold. He doubled back on the defensive. Cyrus threw his coat and raised his fists. A tall, curvaceous woman in black cloth attire stepped into view, her face obscured by a white, festive mask, the likes of which depicted a forest spirit with an unnerving smile and sharpened horns. Knife-like horns. Almost too easy. The mysterious stranger took the violet tear betwixt her fingers. 
its power crackled along the edges of her curves. She breathed loudly, though her breaths quickly turned to rasps. The eye holes of the mask pulsated as beams of darkened energy flew from them. She wobbled on unsteady legs and whined in pain. It wasn't until the woman shoved the tear into the satchel at her hip that her composure returned. Better, she exhaled. Much better. Getting ahead of yourself, don't you think? Cyrus couldn't just let this dangerous intruder walk away, not after the sheer amount of damage and distress she'd caused. You want out of here, miss? You'll have to go through me. He'd bring her down to size. Kay, the would-be thief chuckled. Wisps of black fog came to life within her palms. You can call me Kay, stranger. Not that it'll matter to you in a couple of moments. Cyrus lowered his hands and linked his fingers, battle-ready. He remembered his teachings, especially some of his more unorthodox training. Playing by the rules didn't work against low lives. By my will, Cyrus exhaled. Bring the raging waters to bear. Coldness rose through his body as though he were submerged beneath icy seas. With a confident smile, Cyrus smashed his fists together. Watery gauntlets took shape around his hands and wrists. Okay then, Kay. The acolyte spoke with bitterness, his feelings clouded by the wounded monks he'd seen on the way here. Let's talk magic. You manipulate the shadows. You're a Parsani girl by birth, am I right? A good guess. Kay spun on her heels and moved her body in dizzying, dance-like rhythms. The curves of her hips swayed. Nauseating wails and broken, distorted voices filled the room. A murky cloak hugged the Parsani's body tight. So what does that make you? Are you as bad as all the rest? Do you hate my people for magic native to our homeland? The color of our skin, perhaps? No, nothing so base. Cyrus shook his head, honest if not irked by her assumption. The magic at your beck and call and the color of your skin aren't the problems for me, lady. Parsani girls are just as nice as any other. Cyrus burst across the room on two agile legs. He swung out his fist. My issue arose when you smashed your way into the temple and started hurting innocent people. My people! Kay reached out and blocked his strike with an elegant sideswipe. Cyrus slid back, stunned. A polished shoe careened its way through the fog, smashing against his ribs in a vicious follow-up. Well then, Kay chuckled again, this time colder and far more focused. While Cyrus struggled to catch his breath, she held her arms outward. The inky blackness of her magic spiraled out of control, filling the room in a thick, intoxicating smoke screen. Since you were nice enough to spare me commonplace insults, I shall cut this meeting of ours short. I'm in an awful hurry. Kay backed off. She made for a large window of clear glass behind the Violet Tears pedestal. Cyrus caught his breath. He placed a hand over his mouth and struggled against the fire within his lungs. Kay gave a teasing wave. A black ring of energy pulsed along the edges of the room at the slightest wave of her hand. Cyrus was caught head on and smacked back down to the floor. Well, stranger, Kay turned her back and threw off her mask. It was lovely to meet you, but I must be going. My thanks for putting up a fight compared to the crusty old monks. "'Tis not often I'm made to push my limits.' "'No!' Cyrus shot up, even as his legs threatened to collapse. He gave chase regardless of the pain. "'You're not getting away from me!' Cracks formed in the window at Kay's back. Its construct crumbled apart, reduced to grains of sand, blown away by the evening wind. "'Farewell!' She dropped from the open arch, arms wide like a swooping bird. By the time Cyrus closed in, she was already running for the safety of the surrounding tree line. Until next time, water boy. Damn it all! Cyrus thumped his fists against the stone in frustration. This isn't good. Just how long had the violet tear been here? What am I thinking? The question of why isn't important. Cyrus shook his head in disgust. Forgive me, Lady Eloria. I failed to do my duty. To be continued.